Hello and a warm welcome to our Cogit podcast series. My name is Anthony Richards and I'm the editor editorial director of uh, Cogit. The intention of this podcast series is to discuss particular themes and issues of contemporary relevance within terrorism and counterterrorism. And today's themes revolve around the threat that uh, Al Qaeda and ISIS present, um, some discussion also around uh, the UK's prevent strategy, and also how we might take note of some lessons that might be drawn from the experiences of other European countries. Well, today I'm delighted to be joined by Professor Peter Neumann. He is Professor of Security Studies at the Department of War Studies, King's College, London, and he was the founding director of the International Centre for the Study of Radicalisation, which was founded in 2008. He's also the author of Radicalised New Jihadists and the Threat Against the West, which was published through Taurus in 2016. Peter, a very warm welcome and thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Perhaps the first question then, um, Peter, I'd, I'd, I'd be really interested to know what your assessment is of the contemporary threat, i.e. today, from Al-Qaeda um, and ISIS. We hear about Al-Qaeda strengthening in, in the Sahel in East Africa and the Middle East, um, and also of uh, ISIS presence in South Africa and Mozambique. Uh, what is the sort of nature and severity of these threats? And what's your assessment of that? So that's really complicated. Um, I would say the threat in Europe in particular is lower than it was five or six years ago. Uh, quite clearly, we don't see the same kind of plots or um, attacks happening right now, um, but it is certainly not disappeared. And I would even go as far as saying it is greater than it was one or two years ago. And the reason is that uh, it seems that jihadists have latched on to a sort of an increase in polarization and tension, comments by President Macron, conflicts over the beheading of a teacher in France. This has um, perhaps inspired some people who perhaps previously had been quite frustrated about the situation of the global jihadist movement to become active again. So basically what I'm saying is that we still have a reservoir of um, people who follow this ideology and who under certain circumstances may be willing to act upon it. And I do think that what's happened over the past 10 years, especially in the context of the Syrian crisis, has created a pool of people that perhaps will not always be as active as they were in 2014, 15, 16, that will have problems and difficulties and that where there will be discussions within the movement as we have seen over the past few years, but that these people have not completely disappeared, even though perhaps many of them have turned away from it, have become disillusioned. There's still a core of people who follow this ideology and if the circumstances are right, uh, are willing to act on it. Thank you very much for that, Peter. That's very interesting indeed. Um, in terms of the sort of threats that we sort of hear about in parts of Africa, I mean, mm. do they? I mean, how do they manifest themselves in perhaps countries? We hear that you've spoken about France there, but uh, in European countries in general, the UK and the US, um, you know, is there still a focus on these particular environments and these countries? Um, what are the implications of these sort of uh, emerging threats from afar on, on, on our domestic security? Well, uh, in Africa, as you rightly say, we do have a, a really problematic situation uh, in different parts of Africa where um, jihadism seems to have increased uh, since the end of the so-called caliphate in Syria and Iraq. We have problems in East Africa, Somalia and neighboring countries. Those problems have existed for a very long time, for a number of de uh, decades. We have problems um, in West Africa, um, both um, in Nigeria, neighboring countries, and now basically merging with uh, places in the Sahel where jihadists have been active for a number of years. And now also in Southern Africa, specific, specifically in the north of Mozambique, where there seems to be an insurgency going on that has rapidly over the past couple of years escalated into something 
um, that is threatening the stability in, in, in northern Mozambique, but also neighboring countries. So all over the African con uh, continent, there, seem to be, there seems to be an increase. The good news in that is that so far, it hasn't affected European security all that much. And so we don't see the same effect that we saw with the Syrian crisis, where thousands or tens of thousands of foreign fighters would have traveled to these conflicts to take part in fighting. And equally, we also don't seem that we don't see that diaspora communities in Europe have been particularly mobilized or affected by this. So we're not seeing uh, a great change um, in terms of, for example, Somali communities or Southern African communities or Nigerian communities in Europe that would, uh, uh, would, would be interested in attacking targets in Europe. So this effect has not happened in Europe so far. That doesn't mean that it always has to stay that way, but so far the implications directly for European security are quite limited, I would say. Thank you very much, Peter. That, 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 again, that, that's very interesting indeed. Um, um, a slight sort of uh, switch in, in focus. In your the book chapter that you kindly contributed to our volume, Jihadist uh, Terror, you, you, you noted that um, in your sort of commentary on prevent, and there were a number of observations about um, the prevent strategy in the UK in, in the volume. Um, and you said that actually the prevent, the, the name itself had perhaps become quite toxic. Uh, and um, perhaps there was room for some sort of contemplation as to whether it should be rebranded or not. Do you think there is still a case for rebranding the prevent strategy? Well, rebranding would be a first step, and I think it's absolutely necessary. In fact, in the chapter of the book, I talked about how actually uh, some of the problems with PREVENT go back to the first phase in the so late 2000s when PREVENT was conceived and first implemented in a way that actually, even at that point, lost the trust of Muslim communities in Britain. It was constructed in a way that was quite secretive, that was not very transparent, and that was very heavily relying on implementation by the police. So it was in many respects the opposite of what you would consider to be a community outreach program. And so some of the perceptions that were created at that time, which is that PREVENT was essentially about spying on Muslim communities, it was securitizing Muslim communities, some of these perceptions have never gone away. PREVENT has changed a lot. In many respects, it's become a better program, actually. But the perceptions within the community are still the ones of PREVENT that I just described. And for that reason alone, I would, um, I would recommend that, uh, that it should be called something different. But it has to go beyond that. And I do think community outreach and community engagement will always be necessary. So people who say we should just get rid of prevent um, and abolish it completely uh, are not really saying what should be done in its stead. And so I do think community outreach and engagement are, are, are necessary. It is important to be transparent. It is important uh, to take Muslim communities, but also other communities that perhaps are the targets in quotation marks of these programs to take them seriously as citizens and to empower and enlist them in the effort to combat extremism within their communities. And for that, I think it is important not only to rebrand Prevent, but also to re-examine some of its core assumptions. That's fascinating. Thank, thanks, Peter. I, I mean, you've you mentioned a number of issues there and, and particularly the securitization or the perception of securitization of Muslim communities. Um, um, what does prevent really need to avoid as it moves forward, given its uh, past? Well, it needs to avoid what a lot of the critics of prevent say, which is that it is a, a, a program designed to stigmatize Muslims and criminalize them and suspect them based on their faith alone. That seems to be the core accusation against PREVENT. And in a way, ironically and paradoxically, and not necessarily positively, it's been helped in that effort by the rise of the far-right threat. If you look at uh, 
at uh, cases uh, of people that go through the channel program, you will see that in recent years, in fact, more far right cases have been dealt with by the channel program than, than Islamist cases. So prevent has already actually become quite different from what it used to be. And if anything, there's more, more than ever, there's a reason to go into communities and to explain to them that it is not about targeting Muslim communities and is certainly not about targeting Muslim communities based on their faith alone. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and um, you mentioned the improvements within Prevent. I mean, how would you summarize the positive features of Prevent in general? So uh, I think that pre what Prevent has accomplished over the past 15 years, one thing I would highlight in particular, which is the channel project, the channel program, which is this essentially individually tailored intervention program for people who are believed to be particularly at risk. And there are criticisms about that program and, and you, you know, some of them to some extent justified, but there's no denying that over 15 years, uh, the UK has really built up um, a very systematic expertise about what works in these intervention programs, what doesn't work. And it's also um, actually cultivated a cadre of prevent practitioners, channel practitioners, who are extremely experienced um, in administering these programs. And so as other countries are only just starting to develop these programs, I do think the UK has something to offer here. And that's why I'm also against abolishing prevent outright, because that expertise that has been built up and that cadre of people that, that is involved in it would be lost. And that would be a loss, not only for the program, but also for countering radicalization in the UK. Indeed, indeed. And, and you um, actually, in your book, you actually um, highlighted some examples of good practice in terms of preventing mm. terrorism in, in other European countries. Um, can you summarize perhaps some of the key lessons that we might take from the experiences of other European countries? Well, I mean, the experiences in other European countries are very varied. Um, and it's fair to say that um, some of them are not necessarily much better than in the UK, in some cases, actually worse. Um, also, it's fair to say that many countries uh, have started their programs, if they exist at all, um, after the UK. So they are more recent programs. But generally speaking, if you look at the Dutch example, for example, which I often highlight because the Dutch have been running their program almost as long as the Brits. They, in fact, you know, you can argue about that, but in fact, they kind of started before the Brits even. And they um, have been running a program that has avoided two of the big mistakes that I believe that were made at the beginning of the prevent, which is, First, it has avoided this overt securitization in the sense that it is not the police running these programs. It is local communities and especially local mayors who are in charge of administering these programs. And secondly, and related to that, it is very much a bottom-up program. It's not a centralized program. It is run by local mayors based on what they understand to be the needs of their local communities knowing that mayors know a lot more about um, local communities than the central government. And that is probably also true in the UK. And moving forward, I would, I would recommend that for the UK. Now, when it comes to specific programs, whether it's educational programs, prison programs, um, other kinds of initiatives in different areas, there isn't really one template. I think there are good examples, sometimes very good examples, to be found in different European countries. And you have to really look case by case. Often it is not necessarily the, the government strategy so much that created these good programs, but often in some cases it is the initiative of individual event practitioners uh, that has produced an outstanding result. And that's, of course, very difficult to replicate sometimes, but it's still important and interesting to learn. from. Fascinating. Thank you, Peter. Thank you very much for joining us today. And thank you so much for sharing your expertise and your thoughts with us. Thanks again. Thank you.